Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. Welcome to Condo Insider. It's Thursday. Our show is all about association living, mostly condos. And what our show does is try to educate board members and owners alike on the issues before our association. And I have my favorite guest, is my boss who I ask her every week to fire me on this show, but she won't do it. And that's okay, we both enjoy doing it for the community. And I asked her to come back and follow up my last week's show, which was about can an association ban the American flag? And because of response by people who watched, we're gonna expand it to talk a little bit more about house rules. So we have us today with us, Jane Sugimura, prominent lawyer, smartest girl in the industry in my book. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me here again. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of like who's having who, you know? Yeah. It's like we've been together so many times on this show. And just remind everybody about what you do and what HCCA is. Cause yes, at HCCA, I mean, we're uh, an advocacy group. We go out and, you know, we uh, advocate for condominiums and con uh, community associations before the state legislature, the city council, and uh, other groups, and we educate. We do the seminars and we do the show, uh, mainly because we feel it's important to educate boards and condo uh, owners and uh, people who uh, make their living serving condominiums. Well, it is a volunteer job being on the board, and, and there's a lot of responsibility, both legal and your governing documents, so hopefully many directors want to learn more to execute their job better, and that's what this show is all about. And, We've had tremendous positive feedback, and I was looking at the register of the day. We've done about 115 shows, believe it or not. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been yeah. A I, I, I hope people are watching and, and learning, you know, because you know I think it will result in uh, you know uh, better living arrangements for everybody, the board and the people that they serve who live in their associations. Well, two bills just kind of finishing up last year's legislature that we as an industry advocated for. And I look at it as somewhat balancing owner's rights and the board in a, in a meaningful way, uh, where House Bill 1873 and House Bill 1874. Right. So what happened to them? Okay, they, they, they became law, uh, and I'm not sure if they got signed by the governor or they became law by default, because if he didn't veto them, they became law yesterday. You know, any bills that didn't get signed and didn't get vetoed became law. And so uh, 1870, House Bill 1873, which uh, relates to the priority, priority of payments policy, is now Act 195. Okay, and, and that bill, uh, what it does is it, it tries to clarify, you know, payment plans between uh, associations and unit owners, you know, that could result in uh, uh, foreclosure. And uh, the, the big deal here with this bill is uh, priority of payments is a, a policy that associations, you know, have adopted in the past. And then they use that to apply current payments, and uh, and sometimes it re it results in uh, you know defaults and uh, 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 you know and foreclosure, you know because the unit owner just doesn't understand the priority of payments, doesn't uh, understand that the current payments are being applied to late charges that maybe they didn't know about and legal charges that they didn't know about, and so now this bill says. If you have a dispute, I mean, the prior law says that if you had a dispute, you have to pay everything. By the time you find out if it's $2,000 and, and maybe your assessments are only $100, you have to pay the $2,000 before you can even object to, you know, that amount. And it's, it's the pay now, dispute later. Under this bill, which becomes effective, in fact, it became effective July 1 of 2018, all you have to do if you have a dispute is you pay your assessments. And the assessment is a common uh, expense monthly charge. And the, uh, the statute defines assessment as only those monthly charges. Uh, late charges, attorney's fees, penalties, interest are not assessments under the statute. 
right? So that means they just pay their assessment. If they only owe $100, they pay the $100, and then they can dispute the late charges and the attorney's fees without paying them. And they can do it through mediation and, uh, and evaluative mediation, you know, that we've been talking about over many programs. I mean, they can use, you know, use that uh, form of alternative dispute resolution to try to resolve, you know, that issue. And so when we talk about assessments, we're talking about maintenance fees for right. the common watcher. And it's, uh, all those other things you described aren't included with respect to that. How about House Bill 1874? What happened then? Okay, 1874, and that, that basically deals with the uh, mediation and, and our, uh, arbitration provisions that are in uh, 514B. And it expands the mediation to say, because right now it was only an owner and the board. And now it expanded it to include a board member against other board members and managing agents. And, um, um, and uh, it, it, it added a, uh, a, a remedy where, it, you know, because one of the issues is trying to get the board into the mediation uh, arena. In other words, you you know it's very easy to do mediation. You just call either uh, Mediation Center of the Pacific or Dispute Prevention Resolution, which is and those two entities are in contract with the State of Hawaii Real Estate Commission that supervises the uh, Condo Ed Fund, right? And you just call one of those entities and you say, look, you know, I want to do evaded mediation, and yeah. and they will uh, start setting it up. Uh, and but trying to get the board to sometimes come is, is like pulling teeth. They just won't come. They get you get all kinds of excuses. And I had one that went on for 18 months, and we had to go to court. And and the judge basically you know chewed us both up and, and said you know get out of my courtroom. So we went and, and mediated it. It was over in half a day. What's well, interesting, and uh, our shows about house rules, I'll just sum this up by saying that HB 1874 is now Act 196. Right. So it is like the last bill, now law, effective July 1. No, that one's January 1. January 1. 2019. Okay, January 1, 2019. And it also provides for voluntary binding arbitration. Right, to be subsidized. Want to, agree. Yeah, to be subsidized by the, the condo ed fund. So anyway, as we've talked about those bills many times in these issues, we would tell you that um, uh, they're now law as of July 1, in one case, in January 1, 2019, in the other case. And I know that those of you who belong to CAI on July 19th, next Thursday, they have a current update of the, what happened in last year's legislature in detail on this, plus the sprinkler bill, uh, July 19th. And you can tech, check the CAI website for that. But let's go to House Rules. Okay. Okay. What's the purpose of house rules? The purpose of house rules is basically to allow you know everybody who lives in that community, whether it's a condominium or a community association, quiet enjoyment, which means that you know you you should be able to enjoy owning you know living in your unit or your house you know and so these rules uh, because you have so many people uh, living in close proximity, you need to have rules like quiet hours and and what constitutes a nuisance. In other words, can you turn your TV way up? You know, and you know, blast everybody, you know, uh, out of their unit, or you know, and what about smoking? I mean, can you go out on your lanai and smoke up to the, you know, and 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 if the smoke infiltrates another unit, you know, what about that? And so, so there are rules that uh, that either uh, the well, the state passed a law about smoking. But it's up to the association to, to define where your common elements are. Because I think the, 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 uh, the state law on smoking basically says condominiums that have enclosed areas you know, can uh, set up rules that say where you wear, where you can't smoke. But, but basically, in a condominium, in common areas, you're not allowed to smoke. And so the association has to set up rules to kind of define what do you mean by a common area. Does that mean the park that is, you know, way far away from the buildings, or does that mean the port cashier area in the front of the building, the walkway to the garage? What about your cabanas? Do you want smoking in your cabanas? It's a common area, and under the statute, you could ban 
you know, smoking in that area. So, you know, so the, you know, the association has to make these rules to try to accommodate most of the people. You're not going to please everybody. I mean, you, you can't. There's just so many people. You're, you're, you're going to offend or, you know, there's going to be some people who disagree with those rules. But, you know, if they don't want to live by these rules, they should live in a single family home. They shouldn't be living in a condo. On well, a technical basis, where does the board get the right to have house rules? Okay, the, um, the, the, there's a statutory provision, and that's uh, uh, 514B105, uh, lower uh, B, and also the, de uh, the governing documents say that the board is, you know, has the authority to manage the operations. So that means that they can adopt reasonable rules that the residents have to abide by, uh, in, you know, in order to uh, ensure that, you know, people aren't going to be interfering with, you know, each other's use of their space. And, you know, and, and some of the rules, too, involve, you know, making sure that the property values are maintained because you don't want your place to be a dump. I mean, you want people to take care of the, their, their premises, the common areas. You want to make sure that, you know, the, the building is, you know, is, is kept in good shape. And so, you know, th that's what these rules are for, to ensure that that happens. Well, my general question, so the board can establish house rules per the statute and per their governing documents. The one I see that's, in my opinion, commonly misunderstood, that, for example, the declaration will say dogs are permitted, and the board will want to set up a house rule dogs are not permitted in violation of the Declaration of Bylaws. Can the house rules be in violation of the Declaration no, of Bylaws? No, they, they have to be consistent. They have to be consistent. And, and so if you have a declaration that allows for pets, uh, if you wanted to change that, you would have to change the declaration. And that takes 87, uh, 67 uh, percent of the unit owners to approve. So, what that kind of morphs into is, is that, okay, the declaration says you can have pets, a dog. And then someone will pass a house rule, dogs can't be more than 25 pounds and maybe be not certain breeds because there are a list of breeds by the uh, American Kennel Society, one of those Hawaii Man Society, one of them that are considered a little more dangerous than others. Not that all of them are dangerous, but can the board then take that declaration and it says you can have pets and say, yes, you may have pets, but the dog can't be more than 25 pounds? They can adopt reasonable rules. And I would uh, suggest that anybody who's listening to us, before they come up with these rules, they got to run them by their council. And the council will check them out to make sure that you know they don't violate uh, you know uh, existing laws or you know discrimination, and you have to understand too that there are service animals that might be over a certain weight, or you know, uh, or, or might be a breed that the the board in its draft rules about dogs decides is not appropriate to have in the building. But if it's a service animal, you can, under fair housing. Uh, because they're specially trained, you can't prohibit them from being in the building. You know, so so you got to be really careful. So if you're going to come up with uh, rules for animals, I mean, they they can be reasonable because you know you 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 don't want animals in the building creating a nuisance that are going to interfere with another resident's use of their space. I would generally say about house rules. And I've seen this before, and a lot of associations have not reviewed their house rules in a long time. We know our society and laws have changed dramatically. It probably be incumbent upon every association who has not done this, have their house rules reviewed by their attorney. Because even the issue of having a pool rule such as children under 14 can't swim alone in the pool have been proven to be discriminatory. Yes. Because the issue isn't about age, the issue is about ability to swim. Right. You know, and I see people get sued and get complaints because even though their practice might be different, the rules are inconsistent. And I would just say in general, I don't know what your feeling is, that most associations should have their house rules reviewed, and then as they propose new house rules, have them reviewed by their council. Because yes, the I, I, I agree 100%. And you know, we did do a show on uh, discrimination, and, I, and we, they, they came with this really cute video. And, and the gist of it was, you really, if you're going to make signs and then you're going to make rules, 
avoid the term children, because children is like a buzzword. And, and there are protected classes when you're talking about discrimination, and one of the protected classes is marital, it's, um, um, what is it, uh, the familial status. And familiar status says that, you know, you can't make a rule that's going to discriminate against people with children, right? So, so that's why automatically, if you have a rule that says ch children have to be thus and so, that's probably going to be discriminatory. So you should just avoid the use of children. Yeah. And I would say, because we're going to take a short break, that this is an issue that because of all the discrimination issues that exist today in our society, rightfully so in many ways, that you have to be careful about this as a board to prevent, prevent yourself from being into litigation that's unnecessary because you've just been inconsistent or not clear in your rules to follow the current standards of today. Well, we're going to talk with Jane Sugimura about house rules. We're going to come right back in one minute. Thank you for watching. Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Jay Fardell, founder of Think Tech Hawaii. And I'm Andrea Gabrielli, the host for Young Talents Making Way. Wait a minute, this is not a new, a new episode, is it, Jay? No, it's not a new episode. Um, you know, that show is over, Andrea. So uh, what are you going to do now? Hmm, why don't we have a summer edition of Young Talents Making Way, where we focus more on education as a mean for our young talents to max out becomes role models and achieve their dreams. What a great idea. So when do you want to begin, Andrea? July the 3rd, 2018, Tuesday at 11 a.m. Young Talents Making Way, Summer Edition. Stay tuned. Well, we're back with Jane Sugimura talking about house rules in the first half of the show. You we were talking about the board's authority under the statute and under the government documents to make rules to prevent people from not enjoying their place or quiet enjoyment of their home, as well as to enhance the property values of the association. And we had kind of gotten through their authority. And the next thing I want to say is, who gets to approve these rules? I mean, is this something that they have to go to the owners on? Is it a board decision? Or, or who, get, who gets to decide these rules are going to be in place? OK, generally, it's the board. The board is the one who will you know, uh, decide to amend the house rules. Uh, and, and, and the process is, is that once they come up with a draft that's approved by the board, that draft is circulated to the owners for feedback. And the owners are told, you know, here's a draft, take a look at it, and get back to us with comments, either the property manager or to the board, and we're going to make a decision at a board meeting and the date. And that way, uh, that's the due process, uh, you know, uh, uh, requirement to let them know that if they don't say anything, then the, the draft will probably be approved at that next meeting. And if they, if they do make uh, comments, if, if the board gets comments, then they may consider them. I mean, they'll talk about it at the meeting, you know, and they, maybe they'll approve you know, the change or not. But they can make a decision at that next board meeting to approve the house rules you know, as amended you know, by the comments that they received or adopted just the way you know, it was circulated. And then, and, and in some associations, I've heard that sometimes the owners because the governing documents re, uh, allow the owners to make a decision, but that is not, uh, <clears throat> that would be a small minority of associations who are allowed to do that. Can they make it retroactive? No. I mean, they, can, they can't make it retroactive because that's not fair. I mean, under our uh, Constitution, it's called a de facto law. I mean, that's unconstitutional. You can't make something illegal that happened prior. You know, so that would be like uh, the, that. That would kind of be have that retroactive effect. And even in the legislature, they don't make laws retroactive. 
So should they, in that case, they've approved, let's say, rules, they've taken the owner input, and uh, after they've got the newer rules approved, so they, as a matter of practice, then send them out to all the owners and say, this, these are the new house rules effective August 1, September 2018. Yeah, they usually, the, the, the process is that you usually send them out and, and give them a date, and it's usually 30 days down the road, unless there's, unless there's some kind of peculiarity. Maybe you have to do something, you know, uh, you know uh, physically to the, uh, uh, the property before, you know, the rules can be implemented. But <clears throat> typically it's 30 days. You send them out with a notice saying 30 days from now, these rules will be in effect. And to comment on something you said earlier from my clarification, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that Almost all the associations I'm familiar with, the board of directors under the bylaws has the authority to make those rules. I have seen in my life a half a dozen at most associations that had a provision in their governing documents saying that the owners have to approve amendments to the house rules. So when you were talking about sometimes the owners, you'd have to look at your bylaws. It's, it's very rare to be candid with you, but my experience has been 95 out of 100 times or more, the board has the authority to make house rules. Yes, that's, that's my understanding as well. So how about setting fines? Can, I mean, can the board say, well, I think we're going to have, if you park illegally in this fire zone, the fine is $10,000. What do they have to do on setting fines and, and amounts and things like that? Can they just do what they want to do? Or? They generally can do, you know, what they want to do, but you know, the the the, the caveat is got it's got to be reasonable. You know, when when you do rules, they they need to be reasonable. So if you start getting into large numbers, then you know, on review and everything is subject to review. In other words, if you don't like what the board decides, you may want to appeal it. I mean, by doing mediation or arbitration under the condominium statute. And then you have some third party neutral, either a mediator or an arbitrator, who's going to chime in. And maybe that person will, will, will you know, based on uh, hearing uh, both sides, will find that the $10,000 fine was unreasonable under the circumstances. And then that way it gets thrown out. Well, you know, I had a parking ticket the other day because I forgot to feed the meter and got to the meter late, I should say. It was 35 bucks. <laughs> So for a board to establish $1,000 for improperly parking, I've seen judges throw that out, to be honest with you, it's actually gone into litigation. Mm -hmm. That when you talk about reasonable, it's got to have some basis. And if you look at the general practice, to create these huge rules uh, or huge fines thinking that they're going to be enforceable at the end uh, is probably questionable, mm -hmm. you know, at the best. So okay, so they have the house rules and they have fines. and. My experience has been they begin typically with, in a lot of cases, warning, and maybe some instances are no warning, like defecating in the pool or something like that. Or throwing something off the lanai. Uh, right. So maybe some, you, but they usually have like steps. The first time you do it, it's 100 yes, bucks. Yes, usually, yeah. The process is usually, you know, it's like a graduated uh, penalty type of thing. You have warnings, and, and some, some associations have maybe one or two warnings, at least one warning and maybe a second warning. And by the third time, you, you start getting a fine. And then there's a graduated, it's usually a graduated schedule, $25, $40, $50, $75, $100. And then uh, maybe it'll stick at $100, and it has to be, and usually it has to be the same type of offense. In other words, if you broke a rule regarding noise, you had your TV up too loud. Okay, and that and you 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 got the notices, and finally you got hit with a fine, and maybe next time it had something to do with you're not taking care of your car and you let the oil, you know, uh, drip onto the parking. That's different from the noise. So you start all over again. You have to get a, a, a warning, and then you get the twenty-five dollars. I mean, you can't. It, it's not cumulative. Right. I mean, it's got to be categ categories. You and and and. So you know there are different levels of of, uh, of fines depending on what category uh, you know you you get uh, no, the notice of violation on. What I tell boards all the time is when they set up their annual budget, their budget doesn't include estimated fine revenue. So it's not like they need to have so many fines to match their make their budget balance. Right. And what I've recommended oftentimes when an owner gets a fine they don't think is appropriate. 
maybe they have a defense, they should go to the board meeting and ask to meet with the board either privately in executive session or before the meeting or at the meeting if they feel comfortable with it and talk about it. Because I've said the boards oftentimes and not, what is the purpose of the fine? The purpose of the fine is to get compliance with the rule. So we many times have said to them, look, let's not get in a fight about money. We're going to recommend that we're going to suspend your fine for 12 months. If, in fact, you don't do it again, your fine is waived. If you do it again, the original fine is there, and then the second fine at that amount, and the third fine. And that way, the owner, you get compliance. You didn't depend on the $40 for the fine to balance your budget. And that way, you've got compliance. At the same time, you've kept harmonious community by not looking like the, the traffic cop mentality. Every time you do something wrong, I'm going to write you a ticket. Right. And, you know, I agree wholeheartedly with you because, to me, the board and the association should not be pu You're not there to be punish your neighbors. I mean, you know, maybe some people get, you know, a thrill, you know, the power that you can make somebody else's life miserable. But to me, those type of people don't belong on the board. I mean, everybody there is your neighbor. I mean, you're living in this building. Even if you don't live in the building, you are neighbors. You're part of this community. So the fines should, you know, should be used to get people to comply, not to punish them and beat them up. And I agree wholeheartedly with your approach that you know, you you know, you defer the fine and to see if there's compliance. And if there's compliance, you waive it. And 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 because in the in the end, that's what you want. You want compliance. You don't want to collect the money. The association doesn't need it. And more times than not, to be honest about this, now I see these types of fines, from my professional opinion, more from tenants than the owner. So when you have that tenant violating it, you're going after the owner with respect to the to the fine, and and they have to go to their tenant and talk to them about it. So sometimes the suspending of a fine isn't as effective as the owner going to the tenant and saying, look. You know, I need you to comply pursuant to our lease, so you have to follow the house rules. And it creates some pressure and leverage that way. Mm -hmm. But I've been told by our producer we're out of time. Oh, dear. And, okay. and believe me. And so I wanted to tell you the flag story. I don't have okay. time to tell you the flag story today. But I would tell all of our viewers, we hope you enjoy our educational show. We think it's important to the community that owners and board members alike have information about how to run a great association and how not to penalize your owners, how to create this quiet enjoyment and goodwill among all of each of you. So anyway, we want to thank you for watching Condo Insider. We'll be back next week to talk about public relations issues when you have a catastrophe or association, what the public relations issues are, because it can affect your property values. So, ahoy ho, we'll see you next Thursday, 3 o'clock. Aloha.